It's the chronic. Did you look at the cost of healthcare? I don't, by the way, I don't care if it's single payer healthcare, like you live in Europe and you, you pay high taxes in order to pay for this healthcare system, or you you have this weird, unholy combination of, of capitalism and, and government intervention here in the US or whatever. The cost is still the cost. And if you look at the cost, where a majority of the cost goes, it's the last like 10 to 15 years of life. It's that prevent, it's that chronic disease treating. I got to take these pills to do this and I got to go get another stint in my heart and I got to go do this other thing and I got the chemo and I survived and then, oh, I got, I got, it came back again. It's that last bit that costs so much uh, damn money and so much of it is preventable. All right, check this out. The best healthcare in the world in terms of effectiveness is free. doesn't cost you a dime. I like that. Yes. You know, if you, and I was going to sound silly yeah. and obvious, but boy, I tell you, um, the data is super crystal clear on this, okay? Nothing, there isn't a drug, there isn't a combination of drugs, there isn't a medical procedure or a combination of all of those things that comes close to the chronic health or chronic disease fighting effects, the anti-cancer effects, the heart disease uh, fighting effects of simply exercising and eating right. You do those things and you crush everything and it doesn't cost anything. If anything, it actually saves you money because yeah. of the cost of health. Being your home. own advocate for, for health and, and being preventative about it. I mean, nobody likes to talk about the preventative measures uh, to, to maintain this healthy, thriving body, but that's like the most effective approach that you can have hands down. Yeah. Well, that's the, the irony of that statement is that, you know, a lot of people believe that uh, healthcare should be free and it's a right that everybody should have that. And the truth is it, yeah, it is. And we all have it and it's your choice to make those decisions and make those. And the thing is that everybody wants to wait until they have a condition or they, they uh, got check these, engine lights. Come on. And then, and then, and then they want the, okay, the free healthcare. It's like, well, it was free the 10 years before that you could have done something about it by making better choices. And I know it's a tough pill to swallow for a lot of people, but it's the, it's the truth. It's the only pill you should swallow. What's mm. the, what's the, we don't even need pills. Yeah, exactly. What's that <laughs> what saying? Um, uh, man, you know, mankind, uh, they sacrifice their health to gain wealth and then they sacrifice oh, yeah. their wealth to gain back their health. Yeah. Isn't that the, isn't that the story? It's the conundrum right? of, of that we tend to do. And you know, what's funny is I know we're selling it in, in terms of like health and later on you're, you're not going to have heart disease at, at nearly the same rates and it's great for anti-cancer effects and chronic disease effects. But the, here's the other part of this. It's, it's not just preventative later on. It also improves the quality of your life now, yeah. right now. So think about it this way. So for anybody watching this right now, think of everything you do in your, in your daily life, everything, good, bad, fun, hard, stressful, whatever. Now imagine yourself with better fitness and health doing all of those things. Has it improved all those things? Yes, everything. I don't care what you're talking about. Raising your kids, your job, uh, sleeping, sex, uh, watching a movie. Like, I don't care what it is. A more fit, healthy version of you makes mm. all of those things much better. So it's a dramatic, again, and, and I'll say this as well. There's nothing that will improve the quality of your life in its entirety like doing those things. So it's not just about preventing disease. It's also about just living better right now. Um, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, I know. I, I probably pissed some people off saying what I just said because I, I, I understand that there's uh, things that are hereditary and that people couldn't avoid, right? And, you know, what about them? But to your point right there is that, I mean, by taking care of yourself, even if you were destined to, to get something in the future because it was passed down to you or whatever, uh, the quality of your life would still be dramatically improved even with that that condition. Not to mention... That is not a majority of what overwhelms our healthcare right now. Our healthcare system is overwhelmed with a lot of preventable things that are that are happening. It's right chronic now. disease. Yeah, it's the chronic. Did you look at the cost of healthcare? I don't. By the way, I don't care if it's single payer healthcare, like you live in Europe, and you, you pay high taxes in order to pay for this healthcare system, or you you have this weird, unholy combination of of capitalism and, and government intervention here in the U.S. or whatever. The cost is still the cost, and if you look at the cost where a majority of the cost goes, it's the last like 10 to 15 years of life. 
it's that prevent it's that chronic disease treating i got to take these pills to do this and i got to go get another stint in my heart and i got to go do this other thing and i got the chemo and i survived and then oh i got i got it came back again it's that last bit that costs so much uh, damn money and so much of it is preventable. And then, of course, there's things, like you said, Adam, that are not predictable, um, either genetic issues or, I don't know, you're walking across the street, drunk driver hits you with their car or something crazy. You fall down on accident. You're painting your, your, your house and you fall off a ladder. Imagine yourself handling those things in a more or less healthy version of yourself. So you're, you're, just, you're, just, you're better suited mm -hmm. just because you're more fit and healthy. Uh, mental health is one that's interesting to me because for a long time we would have never considered being more physically healthy contributing to more to better. We mental separated health. those forever. We did, but but the studies are very clear on this. Like just just mild to moderate depression, which is the most common forms of depression, exercise uh, is as effective or more effective. When you follow studies, the longer you follow the studies, the more effective exercise is for treating those things. Why? You don't get. Uh, you know, receptor down regulation. Like you take a medication, your body starts to adapt. Um, and those adaptations make those medications tend to make them less effective or you got to change, you got to change medications or whatever. Exercise, if you do it right, it's effectiveness in terms of health improves over time. So it's, it's just one of those things. And, and it, you know, if you could sell a pill that did everything that proper exercise and nutrition yeah. did, oh my God. I mean, mood, uh, I mean, think about how much better uh, your outlook is on life and like your relationships with people and just your interactions are when you feel good. If I'm a state where I'm in pain, I'm constantly inflamed and I'm not really motivated to move around. Uh, I'm not really wanting to get up and hang out with my friends. I, I don't want to have these kind of interactions uh, that I would have if I have a, a healthy, able body. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a mood elevator. There's just so many um, effects to to maintaining this this healthy body that uh, you know transcend beyond on just like me looking fit and health. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. The giveaway today, MAPS Strong. This is a strongman-inspired workout program, and we're giving you away for free. Here's what you do if you want to win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all of those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section that you won. We do this every single episode that we drop. Also, we're running a sale right now, okay? Check this out. We've never done this before. We took the most popular MAPS program combinations, so two program combinations, right? So the ones that go together, the ones that people like, put a bunch of these combos together, and we priced all of them only $99.99. That's normally the price of one program. It's actually a little less than the price of one program. But right now, $99.99 gets you two programs. If you want to go check out the combos to see if one of them works for you, head over to MAPS August. Com. Once again, it's mapsaugust.com. All right, here comes the show. Speaking of healthy things that we can do, Sal, what were you doing recommending cigarettes to kids? Yeah, what? <laughs> what? When did, oh, man, I was going to bring that up. When did this happen? <laughs> we, we got an angry message, yeah, I got, dude, so I get, we got to address this. I got, okay. a, I got an email, or I didn't personally say it. I normally don't actually even uh, bother you guys with this, right? So Katrina, every once in a while, it'll wake its First, it hits Cassie. Cassie, then normally if it's like a, a big deal or something like that, well then, or something like she doesn't know how to respond, she'll then forward it up to Katrina. And then Katrina sometimes will involve me and say, what do you think about this? And she, she read me this this long old email that someone said, a, a, this lady was very pissed, right? Um, referred to us as a bunch of bros and, uh, and then said that, you know, what were we doing promoting uh, nicotine? Uh, to I think she even referenced young people as as healthy, and I thought, I said, what is she when talking? The hell about? Did we I said, when did we say? When did we even talk about? I didn't. I couldn't even recall. This is a long. T we talked about nicotine a long, long time ago. Remember when the uh, it was really popular? We were. Oh, because it's nootropic effects. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot yeah. of guys over. I remember at the the Onnit crew dudes were like sure. putting the nicotine packets in their in their lip. That's well known, by the way. That's yeah, like, it's but popular. we would never be like, "Hey, kids." Yeah, <laughs> so, but I mean, that was like the last time we talked about it. And she goes, "No, it was like a super recent episode." And so I actually asked Andrew, "I'm like, could you pull it up and tell me what what was said?" I said, "I imagine it was Sal." I said, "I'm sure he said something related to nicotine, and it was, but I don't recall him recommending people." And then. That's what it was. There was a clip where we were talking about the negative effects of of cigarettes, and you made you said it's not nicotine that's the negative thing. And that was literally like the statement you said. Like that was that yeah. was really so, it. Nicotine is not harmful. Yes, it's addictive, like caffeine is, 
but it's actually not harmful. It's all the other shit in cigarettes. It's all oh, the other I chemicals and uh, you know involved. Yeah, we were talking about. Remember. Yeah, we were talking about cigarettes. Remember cigarettes. it was like uh, how they were reducing. There was uh, a law that they're passing. Yeah, the yes. regulation that's going to cut the nicotine amount in cigarettes drastically down or make it a limit. Like there can only be so many, this much nicotine. Yes. And we were speculating on what, what would happen. And, I, and yes. And my, what I was saying is you just, people are just going to smoke more cigarettes to get the same amount of nicotine, which is far more dangerous because nicotine itself really isn't now it's a, it's got addictive properties. Okay. So yep. that, that's true. And in that's some ca- in some cases, nicotine can be inflammatory. In some cases, it can. Co- but really, nicot- if of all the things that are in cigarettes, the nicotine is the safest thing. It's not the bad thing for you. It's all the other stuff that's in the cigarette. So now you're going to make people smoke more cigarettes to get the same amount of nicotine. You're going to cause more problems. That was my point. Yeah, no, I thought your and point it had nothing was, to do with kids. I thought your point was com- <laughs> no. I thought your point was completely there. fine. And and even the, uh, I mean, but that what you just said, I think it'll probably even piss this person off again because I think she that we were you were downplaying the negative effects of nicotine, and I you didn't. I mean, you didn't fear monger everybody around. No, the- it's it's addictive. Uh, so you know, any any addictive type proper uh, you know product or compound can potentially be negative just from the behavioral effects of it. Right. Especially is, when oh, it's paired with lighting paper on fire yeah. and inhaling it. Yeah, if right. you take too much ibuprofen, you're fucked. Yeah, you know, it, the, I mean, if we go down that rabbit hole is my only point, right? Yes. Like if compounds. Yes, so. caffeine's addictive too. Um, uh, very addictive. Anybody who's ever tried to stop drinking coffee will tell you. But nicotine by itself, believe it or not, there, there may be some negatives. There's also some positives. Nicotine has been shown to help with preventing dementia. There may be some brain health effects. There's some neurotropic effects. That's not the problem in cigarettes. Now, that's the part that brings people back. It's the feel good from the nicotine. Yeah. But the negative stuff from cigarettes is all the tar and the carcinogens that you're inhaling when you burn plants and then suck them into your lungs. So when you when you limit the nicotine, just like if I made if I made every cup of coffee limited to 20 milligrams of caffeine, people would just drink three, four cups of coffee to get the same effect. Yeah. Now people are going to smoke cigarettes to get the same effect. Do you, and so that was do you think that we are smoking more or less or the same as a population? And before you answer quickly, because I know you'll say less because we saw a huge decrease in cigarettes over the last decade yeah. or so. But we've also seen the introduction of vaping and yeah. the you know mm. marijuana becoming popular now. So you too. want to count all of that? Yeah. So do you think as a whole, as it's a just society, shifted a bit? Yeah. So, sometimes I don't know if I'm convinced that we've really <laughs> improved. Generally, I think we we've just we've subbed out the 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 drop in cigarette smokers, and then we've now transferred that percentage or that number of people are now because I see vaping. I feel like I see more vaping. And the and the combination of vaping and cigarettes that I saw of just purely people smoking a, a it's decade growing. or two ago. It's growing. Um, okay, so we have to break each one down. We know that we know the negative effects of cigarettes. That's dropped considerably. Vaping wasn't a thing until relatively relatively recently, where that started to grow. Yeah, find me some vaping stats, Doug. Yeah, but vaping mm. has its own risks, not because of the nicotine again, but rather you're inhaling the oil there, other solvents and things in the vape, and there's not a lot of studies to show what this could potentially do. And you know, anytime you breathe something in into your lungs, um, you, you could cause problems. And in vape cartridges and stuff, they tend to have, like I said, solvents and chemicals and. Who knows if the heat generated by the vape is causing some of the plastics to release chemicals. And so there's there's a lot of unknown there. It's also addictive. So your kid isn't smoking, but now they're addicted to vaping. So there's always, you know, those dysfunctional And habits. the idea that it's, you know, quote unquote, healthier for you or better for you than also probably promotes you doing even more That could of it. be it too, you know yeah. It's kind of like the yep. whole diet soda versus regular sodas because you know there's no calories attached to it. So you end up drinking six of them a day, whereas if Good you point. were drinking mm-hmm. regular yep. Coke, you just have one. So. Marijuana use has gone up for sure in certain uh, populations. Uh, from negative effects, marijuana has some negative effects. Lung cancer is not one of them. Uh, it, it hasn't been shown to cause lung cancer, although it's full of carcinogens, the smoke is. But the speculation is the anti-cancer effects of the cannabinoids. Like a net uh, zero. Yeah, so it's like you're not really getting cancer in your lungs from it uh, because of those. Uh, but there's other negative effects. What does that say, Doug? Well, there's it's a bunch of stats really here was. regarding vaping. Uh, in 2020, 196 percent of high school students and uh, 4.7% of middle school students used e-cigarettes, but that's a big drop from the prior year. What, what years? What was that year? That's 19, 2020. So that's as recent. A couple years ago. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it went up and then it went kind of back down. It went back down. <laughs> you mean it went down when there was nobody in school? 
That's probably partly that. Yeah, <laughs> nobody's watching. That, that makes school. a lot of sense, yeah. actually. Yeah. <laughs> Although you know. they're like, "Oh, huge reduction <laughs> in kids smoking at school. Schools closed." Uh, yeah. Yeah. Dude, speaking parents of, are around. It's all the interesting. Time. Yeah. E-liquids contain sixty chemical compounds. There you go. See, e-cigarettes contain forty-seven. Yeah. See. That's oh. and there's a lot of those unknown. Like yeah. we don't know what they're causing, and I I would venture to say probably not good. Uh, you want to talk about breathing things in? So I was my, with my dad the other day, and I told you guys he just got over COVID, but he still has this like lingering cough, mm -hmm. and he goes, "It's so weird." So he goes, "When I get sick, it always attacks my lungs." Now my dad has worked in construction and with his hands, you know, and that kind of work his entire life. Yeah, never wore. I mean, especially in Sicily as a kid. Yeah. Never wore you know, sawdust, asbestos. He's just, he's just breathing just in the, all kinds. Of just even the cement and the yeah, and the yeah. thin set and the glue and the whatever the lime, you know, the powder. I mean, yeah. when I used to help him as a kid, I would breathe that shit in. When nobody wore anything, mm -hmm. so I was asking, I was telling him about that, and he goes, "Oh, he goes, I guarantee you." So he had his uncle passed away from lung cancer in his mid seventies. Never smoked, and the doctors are like, "Oh, it's because you worked with asbestos." When my dad was a kid. He worked in an asbestos factory, right? Or, Is that how you or, say it? I was saying what asbestos. Oh, I thought I said asbestos. I asbestos. I don't know which way asbestos. am I saying it right. Yeah, yeah. whatever. Oh. Okay. He worked where they would use these these big. They would make these big tubes and these fireproof whatever. And now he wasn't in the factory factory, but he would use them when he'd make them. And every once in a while, they'd have to cut one in half, and it would create a dust. And he goes, oh. "Yeah, nobody, nobody did anything. <laughs> we didn't cover our face." Yeah. Then he told me about this factory in this town in Sicily by where he grew up, where they were they were like the top factory for making these products and because they're making it, the dust is everywhere. Uh -huh. And he goes, all of a sudden, you know, the, the owner, the workers there started getting lung cancers and diseases, then their spouses, then their kids. Cause they would come home with all the powder on their clothes mm -hmm. and the wives would wash the clothes and the, the powder. And he goes, they shut everything down. And he goes, this town became a total ghost town because of it. Wow. He goes, but we didn't even know. Wow. See, there's on? so much back then. They didn't know anything about these chemicals. Like my grandpa died at early death and I still, they were attributing it to like high cholesterol and uh, because he had a heart attack. But I was like, there's, there's something else there. And it wasn't his diet. And, you know, going back and thinking about it, he worked at like a chemical plant and it was like for a pesticide, you know, company. And we know now, like all of the the warnings and and you know things that we found from you know glyphosates or any of these type of like insecticides, and I'm just like my brain just keeps I get hung up there because it's like how much do we really know you know from a lot of these things uh, back in the day even that now affected us till now. What about the stuff now? Yeah, that we're doing now. Well, we're yeah. What do you out. what do you think is worse? You think breathing in something or like potentially like a, what I mean what like skincare and makeup stuff was just like 20 years ago where you're rubbing chemicals on right. your face every single day once or twice a day you think they get you, they get tested more at least oh really they do they have to go through different more vigorous I mean, it's just not perfect testing but has it uh, always been that way or is that like new like because it's it's been more that way than than not um i don't know what it looks like now i know now when you work with uh compounds that you may inhale is like if you work in construction and stuff there's new regulations and they're much more aware because of asbestos i think that's probably what caused it all but for a long time there was it's funny like i said i was talking to my dad i said what about the what about the cement that you this the bags of cement that you guys breathe in when you open it up and the and he he laughs and he, he, we're driving in his van because we were moving some couches, and we you know we get to the house he he had a bag in the back and he goes what's that right and there's a big ass cancer warning sign on it and we start he starts laughing he goes it's been on the back dude <laughs> Forever. but we breathe it in and nobody says <laughs> so anything. do you so what do you think is worse do you think the breathing in something like that or do you think skincare type stuff that you apply once or twice a day every single day what do you think depends is, on what it is have you ever effect, have yeah. you ever heard of the the women that got cancer, there were these watches that that were made for a long time, and they would put uh, radioactive material on yes. the arm, on the hands on the watch. I heard about that because they would glow. I don't remember what it was called, and they actually and all these women they would use little paint brushes to paint the uh -huh. watches, and then they use their, their tongue, tongue to create to, a point. Yeah, make a and point they all got the cancer. Brush. Yeah. They all got uh, cancer later on. I remember. Didn't something uh, like that happen with licking envelopes a long time ago too? I thought oh, something I don't happened know. around those lines, something like that. I don't know. I know oh, my wow. mom used to tell me that when she was a kid, they would tell the kids, like the, the urban legends were, they'll put acid on the on the envelope. Don't lick it. You're going to go to trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, skincare stuff is a big one. And a lot of the stuff we put on our skin, we don't really even pay attention to. Um, you know, One of the reasons why we work with, with uh, Caldera is that the, everything they have in there is, is natural. Mm -hmm. There isn't, there isn't like synthetic chemicals and weird stuff and everything's got clinical studies and has been around for a long time and has been used for a long time. 
Uh, look at your skincare stuff. Read yeah. the read the back. Like how much of that is has it's been a tested? Sponge, man, it's a huge organ. Well, that are you're they just applying chemicals? on Are they regulated like supplements? Where it's very supplements aren't regulated. No, that's what I mean. Yeah. That's what I mean. Are they are they not regulated? Oh. Really? Like it's like you know, could you buy a skincare thing and it say, oh, this this and this is in there, and it's like eh, none of that shit's in. there. Oh no, they're they're regulated. They uh, are. Yeah, they are regulated. You know, it's not very regulated. Uh, so how weird is that 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 skincare is regulated, but then supplements are are not? Yeah, I know. I don't know if I if I'm pro. I, I'm not really pro regulating supplements either, though, because I'm. A, I know what happens when they do that uh, in these markets. It's not necessarily a. No, I, I don't think any thing. of us are. I just find that interesting that yeah. something that you would ingest and you would take, like a pill or a powder, uh, they're not regulated. But then there's if you put a cream on your I, face, that's more regulated. I believe in 1994 there was an, a supplement act or something. Maybe Doug can look it up. That made it so that supplements could be sold so long as they make no medical claims without having to go through and be regulated by uh, FDA, so long as it's not like toxic or hurting anybody. So you can still be liable. Hmm. But I can't remember what it was, and I want to say it was an act in 1984, the Supplement Freedom Act, or I don't know, something. I may, maybe I'm making that up. Maybe Doug could find it. Uh, but yeah, So I so. wonder why skincare can't fall into the same category as supplementation. Yeah. And it, it's oh, it was. 1994 Dietary Supplement uh, Health and Education Act. So it prohibit, it prohibit dietary supplement manufacturers and distributors from making false claims such as natural and therapeutic. However, it also regulates them differently than like drugs and stuff like that. So they're it's wide open in the sense. Can you look up how the how you know beauty and skincare is regulated? Then I'm just curious to like how, how stringent it is. And you know, I know Caldera; they do all kinds of like studies on the stuff that that's inside there. Ton, if you go on their website, the, they'll they'll there's tons of studies. And that, is that is that I, I would assume that's part of why the cost is higher than normal is that they are proactively probably doing that and they don't have mm. to technically do that because yeah, I don't see that with every every product out there where you see all these crazy studies to support what's inside of it. Yeah. So I would I, say, I would think so. Yeah. What does I, that say, Doug? Uh, <clears throat> so the law does not require cosmetic products and oh, ingredients so. other than color additives to have FDA approval before they go on the market. Wow. But they are FDA. But there are laws and regulations that apply to cosmetics on the market in interstate commerce. Um, don't know what that means. Oh, that's weird. So <laughs> yeah. I guess if you sell it, if you sell it across state lines and it's under some, it's regulated more. So See, if you're it sounds, buying, like it, sounds like it's a little gray area, you know? So if you're buying a, if you're buying skincare that is only sold in your state, you might want to be careful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why don't you sell another state flag there? <laughs> this stuff is great, man. I get high when I rub it on my face. You know? <laughs> yes. Well, the FD and C act prohibits the marketing of adulterated or misbranded cosmetics in interstate commerce. So, mm. I mean, Seems very great. You know what's very great. Okay, yeah. so here, just to freak everybody out even more. So here's <laughs> here's what's here's what's weird, right? So you could have an ingredient that's been tested. By the way, when they test something, they don't test it for five or ten years. They test it for three months, six months, right, right. whatever. Okay, so because there's a difference, right? You could use something for three, six months, nothing shows up. Five, ten years later, maybe something does show up. So that's one. But then number two, there's no. They don't test combinations of things. So I could use I could use a product that has 50 ingredients and the combinations of these ingredients have never been tested. Only things that have been tested are each individual by itself. So when you combine them, is there a cumulative effect? Right. Is there a synergistic kind of effect? Re yeah. Reaction you're going to receive as yes. a result. Yes. Like all these xenoestrogens that uh, have kind of estrogenic effects in the body on their own, on the doses that are tested, maybe, maybe not, or super mild, undetectable at, at, for, you know, six month periods. Mm. But then you've got 15 of these things in, the same product that you use every single day, then maybe there is. Yeah. It sounds sketchy to me. Yeah, it, it sounds. It, it, it's not well, I feel like it, it it's kind of common sense. Like if you, you, they're by themselves, and like you said in a study, not such a big deal. But then when you when you start to look at all the places that you are, you're getting all this low level stress or insult. You know, the body, whether it be the receipts, and then your hair product, your skincare product, what you're breathing in yep. or smoking, and combine and everything. Yeah, you start combining everything, and it's like, okay, well, where are the studies to show like if somebody is doing all those things for weeks and months and years? How good or bad could that potentially be? Like, there's no, there's no study. There, is, there is no, yeah, there, there isn't any of them with, with with that. I know it's kind of weird, right? Yeah. You know, that's why you know it's another one. Um, Do you know that uh, one thing that Alzheimer's patients have in common are typically high levels of aluminum in their really? system? Yeah, and you know what uh, has aluminum? 
antiperspirants, a lot mm -hmm. of antiperspirant de deodorants have yeah. aluminum in them. This is why some pregnant women will avoid using antiperspirant deodorants. You know what else makes your body retain aluminum? I just learned the other day, fluoride. Maybe you can confirm that, Doug. I don't want to be one of those fluoride. You, know, <laughs> you, know, like, fluoride, fluoride you just confirm this, that. Does fluoride from, from make your body? Put, there is a viral. There's a viral TikTok thing, and it's made its way to reels. And I don't know who started it first, but I think it's really funny. Uh, and it's like it's like some some guy starting off his day, and he's getting ready to bite into like cereal, and then like it, it, another screen pops up, and it's like a, a real popular fitness health expert or or influencer that is like. Cereal is the worst thing you could do to start your day, and he like spits out the cereal. Then he goes over to uh, make some. I think it was like uh, make some sort of like fruit and vegetable thing, and then it, it goes over to uh, uh, Paul Saladino talking about how bad fruits and vegetables are. <laughs> he spits that out. Then he goes. Then he goes over. And he goes to brush his teeth, and then some some doctor pops on there and talks about how dangerous fluoride is for you. You can't. It's so it's a really funny little viral TikTok thing that's going like around. You're, you're, your everyday average person like experience. Yeah. Just any influencer telling them. Something. Yeah, and then it's like, I, yeah, co like contradicts this. It's yeah. so good because uh, it's a great perspective. I know. Because we we obviously didn't we weren't inundated the same way that you know a, a twenty year old kid is today with all of these. And they're all what, what they do good is it they're all you know either either they'll back those their their yeah. arguments. That's up. right. They're either credible people. I mean, talking about someone a friend of ours, Paul Saldino, and and I know where he's coming from when he says that. But you know, it's such a cool perspective for like imagine being that seventeen year old kid who's trying to figure out Dude, what do I eat, what do I do. You know, what an interesting thought because. Because when we were growing up, it was like you had standards and you had things mainly like sent from, you know, government or other like major institutions. And it was like rock solid, like this is truth. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of like competing ideas and yeah. information that like people were were diving through. It was like, this is just how it is. And like we find out later it was wrong. And so now we're just in this chaotic world of information. It's, well, it's like what we talk about, the pendulum. Yeah. It was like what on this side where it's like you said, you know, the government put it out one way, the only way. And then we find out later, okay, that's a bunch of bullshit. That's not true. And then now we get inundated with like every 15 seconds a TikTok video telling you what you should or shouldn't do. And so it's like, yeah, it's, what do I, it's funny because I like more information. I like having to sift through. Most people don't. Most people, just no. like when you hire a client. Uh, when, when a client just tell me what to do. Oh, you're average person. Yeah, no, they just, just want me. the simple, yeah. like give it, give it to me in like a real digestible yeah. form. Yeah, no. So, so uh, fluoride does increase the absorption of aluminum uh, in your in your system. So I wasn't wrong. Cool. All ah. right. So, uh, speaking of weird information, I hate how much everything has become politicized these days, including science. There's a an art. There's a publication called Scientific American. I I love them, but recently I'm reading some of their stuff and it's just making me shake my head. So this, <laughs> I'll read you the title of this article. I sent it to you guys uh, today, in fact. It's one of the most ridiculous, ridiculous things I've ever read in my entire life. Here's the title. Eating too much protein makes pee, so your urine, a problem pollutant in the U.S. So I don't know if you guys knew this or not. Wow, you called that. <laughs> if you eat too much protein, you're you're harming the environment with your. You called that. You'd have to, have to go back feet. to that clip. I mean, that goes all the way back to uh, our previous studio. I think when you when you said that that protein we, would be yeah demonized. we were speculating on the future of the fitness industry, what would be next to be demonized, and uh, and you did say protein. I guess protein, but for different reasons. Yeah, I thought it'd be protein because we were going down the list of macronutrients, fats, carbs, and well, well, next is protein. But and I was right, but not because of that. It was because uh, there. It, this is uh, so that's harming our environment. That's what I'm saying. It's political now. That's insane. It's like how can we and why is it political? Because uh, there are you know there's a, there's definitely a, a political power I should say in getting people to not eat animal products. There's a definitely a, a divide right now, and so protein being connected to that. So now they're gonna, they're going to demonize Meanwhile, protein. Glyphosate is in everything. Uh, you know, birth control is in our, our tap water, <laughs> right? But like, your pee but, is bad. Oh, but my pee is bad because I'm eating protein. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, yeah, I know, yeah. right? Gotcha. I again, thought that was natural. Again, though, yeah. just imagine being a young kid who's like into health and fitness and you're trying to sift through all this stuff. Like, what? What do I, I believe? What's the worst? Like... I was just on. Uh, I was on uh, Mike Matthews' podcast. So Mike Matthews, found, <laughs> yeah, no, founder no, of. Uh, I'm sure there's a few rants. Uh, uh, oh, dude, I, I walked. I walked in. They were recording, and I knew he was recording with Mike. So I, I peeked my head over, and was, and I could tell they were like in deep conversation. Like Mike was going on a rant or whatever. 
And then I sat down and put the the headphones in so I could listen, and they were already like going down <laughs> oh, the yeah. conspiracy rabbit so, hole, dude. Oh, I was like, oh, my I God. love Mike, one of the smartest yeah. guys uh, in our space. He's the founder of uh, Legion, so one of our sp- supplement sponsors. Great products, right? And, great and great friend too. Super smart guy. Super smart He's guy. Very smart He's guy. one of those people that will yeah. read something and remember it forever. And him and I, a lot of integrity just, too. You know, that's yes. part of why we work with with Legion and him is because the guy operates from a, a really really good place. Well, he won us over when we we talked to him about the supplement industry and how honest he was about the whole thing. Well, most honest business. Uh, business guys like we've met. Yeah, and he was like, look, I could charge less, but then I'd have to do this and I'd get my products from here and here's why I don't. And we were like, oh my God, you know, that, that makes any sense. So my margins are smaller, but now my products have what they say they do. And then, you know, he would show us 30 party testing. This was way before we even talked about working together. It was just, you know, very honest guy. But yeah, he goes off, he was going off and we were talking about, I guess the, there was this uh, like op- like Operation Trust in the Soviet Union. I had Operation no, Truth, I think I heard. Or Truth it was, yeah. yeah, yeah. Where the, the 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 goal was to basically put out just confuse the shit out of people to the point where they just have to sit back and I got to trust what you guys. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to think. So I'm wow. just gonna wait for you guys to tell me. And he was telling me the steps that they took. I'm like, oh my gosh, that I'm sounds, sure it's very parallel. That sounds seeing. very very. Yeah. Speaking of which, did you guys see what just came out? That the CDC worked with social media companies to censor uh, COVID vaccine, uh, what they said, disinformation uh, during the whole pandemic. So that CDC actually went, the Department of Justice- so they proved this. Say, sorry, the DOJ, the Department of Justice. Yes, it's- uh, it's, it's it, uh, Because, I mean, this was speculation. We kind of knew this that, This was conspiracy. Right? This was all those things uh, because, it, I mean, it, unfortunately, like, if you have that kind of- um, you know, skepticism. It's like, no, let's shut down yep. any of your skepticism, it, like any thoughts in that direction, because we have to push this. It says right here. So this is a, a trove of internal communications obtained by American America first legal. It was a CDC, sorry, CDC regu- officials regularly communicated with personnel at Twitter, Facebook, and Google over vaccine misinformation at various times. CDC officials would flag specific posts by users on social media platforms as example posts. And basically, they said, "Hey, you guys, uh, all you guys, this is this is what's okay. This is not what's okay." And um, they worked with them and agreed. So you know, all the speculation of like all these people getting blocked and all this yeah. stuff. I can't even say this and what's going on. I mean, that's true. Now, how how do they get uh, like what are the laws that even exist anymore uh, in that regard? In terms of well, that can being can't unlawful, do. not anymore. Well, they can't. Well, not with a private company like that either, right? I mean, it's their choice to send. They, uh, technically, Instagram and those those platforms could. So they just base it off like an emergency act, and so thank they, you. It absolves them a- of yeah. uh, yes. After these after, crimes they commit. After September 11th, we passed uh, acts like that, laws like that, where if they consider it um, a threat to national security, which is a very broad yeah category that they can go in, the government can go in and regulate these things. And they can also tell you that you can't tell anybody. So they could go in, they could tell you if they think it's national security and there's no oversight in the sense that there's no judge, trial, jury, no warrant. And they could tell you, you can say this, you can't say that. By the way, you can't tell anybody we told you this. And if you go against what we say, here's all the potential penalties and issues. I mean, this just screams why it's important to have skepticism. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> right? Yeah. Like when you see shenanigans, if you feel shenanigans, uh, obviously there might be something there. I know. That's crazy. It's hey, such it's a, it's proven. such a weird, weird dance. So because you got to think that part of that was, was, that was done in Obama, right? No, no, no. Oh, you mean as uh, the, the, after September 11th? Yeah. No, yeah. that was Bush. Oh, it was Bush. Who, yeah. okay. Cause you got to think that like part of that was that the, the process to be able to prosecute somebody was so took so long that potentially other bad things could have happened. And baloney. So you, I know. I mean, but there's no evidence of that ever. It's baloney, complete baloney. That's not true. It, it's, it was, it was a, it was a take, a, take advantage of, of a situation yep. and pass things that give us more power and less, you know, look, look, I mean, isn't, in, it, isn't it always that it's, it is yeah. it's <laughs> on <inconvenient>. every level. <laughs> look, it's inconvenient. If you're, in I feel power, like it's always that. And if I can tie it to, if I can justify it with some sort of means, then it's, it's all green light. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Oh, if I, if this attach it to a crisis, yeah, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm part of the government, it's like, Oh, we can, we can gain more power and, and more potential money by creating well, more departments. You ever see shit. how they, you ever see how they, and we can justify bills? where people will go, Oh, that makes sense. How I think have we gotten into idea. every war? 
if you go back in history, just look at like what started the war. Yeah. yeah m- most of the time, it's something that wasn't even true. A lot of times. And, and yeah. And look at the spending bills. They'll pass a spending bill. And what's attached to it is all this other stuff. And sometimes these bills are so big, they'll give them to a senator and they'll be like, we need to pass this now. People need money now. We need yeah. this help right now. And they're well, like, I can't read all this. Like, yeah. pass it anyway. Patrick Bet David just did a clip on his Instagram that I thought was really good. That, and he and he was talking about, um, you know, the the most ideal, perfect candidate for our country to get us out of this situation or move us in the right direction. And he went over all the list of things that they would have to do as far as shrinking government and cutting this out and doing yeah. that. Nobody's gonna vote for that. No, <laughs> yeah, I know. Like literally, you could not campaign on that. Like yeah. the, the, on the both perfect, sides. Nobody the wants perfect that. man or woman to take us in the right direction. Like the perfect situation. Like economically, socially, all those things. What they would have to campaign on in order to win, they couldn't. Have, they couldn't campaign no, on that. It's brutal. It just wouldn't work. Isn't that yeah. crazy? I, I know. think that. I know. It's so well, funny. Just, yeah, that's where we're at. All right, I'm gonna take us in another direction. So I just read an interesting study on tattoos. That um, I th- this is really fascinating to me. So. You know your body, how important your body's ability to sweat is for your health, right? Yeah. Have you guys ever worked with anybody who had a disorder where they didn't sweat? Yeah. I forget what it's called. There's a, there is a, there's a name for it. I've heard of it, but I haven't worked so with it. So you have. Like yeah, yeah. We're really dangerous. Yeah, no. I actually, that, that same client, um, she almost passed out one time. Yeah. Wow. So, and because and I was a very young trainer at the time. Um, I actually don't even think I knew that she had it up until this point. And I was using, you know, like her, how she was sweating, or in her, this case, the lack of it, that I wasn't pushing hard enough. And I kept increasing the intensity, increasing the intensity to the point oh, where no. she ended up just getting lightheaded and having to lay down. But I was like, damn, I, I didn't think you were having a hard time whatsoever. I didn't see any, her sweating. And I'm like, we were doing a lot. I of had stuff. a client like that too. And, and they told me ahead of time because I did a whole assessment or whatever. They're very dangerous. They overheat, they could die because yeah. Yeah. it's a very important thing that we sweat, right? So check this out with tattoos. Did you know that having tattoos reduces your your ability to sweat? They did studies on people with one arm fully tattooed versus the other one, and it was like a fifty percent reduction in sweating. Oh, that's weird. In the side that was tattooed, I'll have to the next workout. I'll like, I'll take. <laughs> I was a look. just gonna I'll ask you because you guys, you're right versus you yeah, know, yeah. Left now arm. I, you know, I've never really paid attention to that, but I, the next time, I isn't get, that like, weird? Get a real sweat. I mean, it makes kind of sense, right? You're, sh- you're what are you like damaging the? Well, yeah, or you're you're yeah. injecting ink into your pores. Right, I mm-hmm. think it would clog it up a little bit. I don't know if it's the clog. I don't think it's clogging. I think it has to do more with the, the the nervous system and how it or the adaptation process of your body now is becoming like something. But yeah. I, it's such a weird thing, right? Like so, being fully tatted that could that could be maybe it's closing thing. it up because you're you're basically well, you're tattooing, you're shooting ink into these pores. Mm. So maybe the body adapts and says like, oh my god, I'm taking in this potentially harmful shit. So I'm gonna I'm gonna not allow it to be more I don't know, I'll, breathable I'll, or. Okay, here's here. I'll read it right Throwing here. Throwing spaghetti on the wall right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's only one study. This is only one study that's ever done it. And now everybody's like, oh shit, we got to learn more about this. So the, the, the heavily tattooed people may be more at risk of heat related injuries as their bodies are not able to expel heat as quickly. And uh, it has to do with the maximum sweat rate that could be attained. But I, there's no speculation as to why, like why or how. You know, this may be caused, so I don't know. I mean, it obviously is, it can't be that bad because if if all the tattooed people were dropping like flies because of- Oh, it's this. damage to sweat glands within the skin. Yes, yeah, sweat glands. That's so, what they think. So, so yeah. it's just the, the actual physical damage of Could be. dragging the needle. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Could be, yeah. I know. Oh, that's I know, isn't that weird? But I yeah. will though watch now. now. Now I'm gonna be all curious all when I work out and see if one side is sweating more than the other side. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was uh, you know when I when I was uh, like I said when I had that client, I had no idea, and she's like, yeah, I don't. Uh, she's like, I don't sweat. I'm like, okay, you know, I've heard people tell me that before. She's like, no, no, I literally have a medical condition where I don't sweat, and I could totally overheat and die while we're working out. Yeah. Oh. Holy shit. Well, see, okay. that's the weird thing. I found as I've like aged, I sweat more in like different places. Like, so like my lower back is like more sweaty than it was previously. That's weird. It trips me out. It's weird because you have a tattoo there too that does I you don't, think it would I sweat. Don't. <laughs> don't have one. Yeah. That's the unicorn jumping over the rainbow one. No. Yeah, right? yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's a really, yeah, it's a really yeah. good one. <laughs> that's yeah. right. <laughs> You know, I know such a colorful I, tattoo. I know you moved us away from <laughs> government stuff, but I you, did you guys see the article that uh, Jackie sent over to us that had to do with Ring? Oh, that they can access your Ring camera without a warrant and just yes. watch through your shit. Wait, what? Yes. So if you <laughs> just, have Ring, I got right? Ring. Okay. The, supposedly, cops can access that without getting any sort of warrant. Yeah. 
How dare they? Yeah, dude. That's my place. Yeah. Wild, right? Do you know why? Okay, so, okay. Uh, remember when- It does when not we, seem lawful to me. Remember when we were in Cabo and, uh, you know, we put the baby to bed? Yeah. And Jessica had a monitor, but we couldn't go very far with yeah. the monitor because we have a monitor that it's like, it's like wireless. And you're like, oh, you got to get the one we have where it goes through the Wi-Fi and I can watch it on my phone or whatever. Yeah. So I'm like, why don't we have that, right? So I told Jessica, I'm like, why don't we get the monitor, the baby monitor, so I could watch it from anywhere? Yeah. She goes, no. She goes, there's a huge problem in. with them being hacked by yeah. weirdo. Hack the camera, watching your kid. And then there's been cases where people will hear people talking through the camera yeah. to their kids through these freaking cameras. Well, like, oh, picked, hell no. I've, p- I've picked up stuff like that before where you pick up somebody else's signal and you hear you hear something through. It's oh, a little, hell it's a little no. freaky The, the fun part is, is if you have somebody like we had somebody watching our house and we're on vacation and then, you know, we yell at them through the ring. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? When they're taking the dogs out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, so they don't need a, a warrant to access that for like evidence. They just have it accessible. Is that you telling me? Uh, yeah. I'm going to do something about that. <laughs> Is there another company like that's competing? That yeah. So what I didn't, that? what I didn't, see, I don't remember when I was reading the article, if it, it's like all these companies are like that, or just in particular ring has some sort of contract well, or deal. Dude, I don't know. You yeah. ever, you ever go to a friend's house and they have There's the, they there. have the little camera on their computer taped over. Yeah, on their phone. I do that. Katrina does that. On I all, freak all, out. All, all of ours. Yeah, because someone could hack in and watch your shit. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Well, I just feel like that's just the case with any camera, even on your phone. It's just like it. it you're just opening that up for any kind of person to even like. I, I, I don't know. I speculate a lot with like the the whole voice um, in Alexa and all that kind of stuff. And they've been busted too with like Alexa being. Uh, gathering a bunch of data on people. Well, you guys that saw bitch. that. You guys saw that uh, clip that Joe Rogan just posted up not that long ago of oh, the agreement t- clause or the whatever? the agreement clause for TikTok. Uh, all the things they have access Basically, to. Basically, if you get TikTok, you have you've given them permission to spy Dude. everything on your phone. Go everything. Your keystrokes, yeah. your files, and your, your notes. photos. Yeah, I everything. mean, come on. and even and then the part that was crazy to me was that they are they're even allowed to your phone ID, to, all that to, stuff. Yeah, IP, yeah. phone ID, all that stuff to get in through another computer access. Like you were yeah. saying, like if there's a computer nearby, they can still yeah. access. Like what the? I know it's so crazy. Wild. Right. I'm gonna take us fitness. It is wild. I'm gonna take us back <laughs> to fitness. fitness podcast. I know. <laughs> so I just read some cool studies on mind also. on mind and muscle connection. I actually have so. Oh, good. I'm glad you go this direction because I have something related to fitness I want to talk so about. So check that. this out. They use used um you know em i think it's is it emg um where they measure muscle activation yeah, yeah yeah on people working out doing a compound lift like a bench press and the person's doing the bench press and they measure the emg of the triceps shoulders and chest then they tell the person focus more on your chest focus more on your triceps yeah. focus more just by thinking how much did it change it and it, it did it did change it, it did. significantly yeah just by focusing on it through so this, we have proof now of what bodybuilders have saying you know forever, which is you know concentrate and focus on the muscle and okay. I'm so glad you, I'm glad you went this direction hmm. because I got tagged yesterday in you know some some fitness influencer chick that was saying that uh, it said like hypertrophy training is best for uh, for building muscle like not not for I mean excuse me uh, machines are best for building oh, muscle not free weights. And it's and you know who she was uh, referencing was the who's the guy that you went back and forth and you don't like lift lift run bang oh, guy yeah, yeah. right yeah and he's that guy does not get uh, you know he doesn't get angry and upset well I want what I wanted <laughs> so because I got tagged and I know we we've addressed it. this on the show again but I, I you know I think it's something that we should address again like that the thing when you and because a lot of these smart guys these smart guys that are that are saying this he's not a dumb guy right and he uses studies to try and make his point. But the thing that they're not, they'll take like a study again that's like eight weeks long, and they'll and they'll try and prove this point, or they'll take the EMG, oh, muscle activation, therefore it's better for. Oh that. yeah, that's not the be all end all. Yeah. But you also got to think part of the the ad- adaptation process is the learning curve, and this is what we've talked about before. So it does not take very long to get under a leg press and and the body to adapt to that because of how easy it is for the body to do it. When you compare that to like a barbell back squat. So the adaptation process is longer. Therefore, some of the benefits and carryover that you will get in terms of building muscle slash burning. It's a gradual increase. It, yeah. So maybe in a shortened study, you may be able to show, oh, yeah. there was more muscle activation yeah. in here. And then they, they make the leap. Come Therefore, the hot, builds you know. more muscle than this barbell back squat. 
But I would make the argument that if you took, you know, two different people and for a year's time or say two years time, one always leg press, the other one always barbell back squat, and then you compared those. The squat would win. The squat would win. Yeah, and you're right, Mike, you're right. At, out the gates, the leg press might produce a little bit faster in terms of hypertrophy. Because you don't have to learn the balance, the stabilization, the technique. It's, it's easier. easier to get that mind muscle yes, connection. Yeah. Very easy to focus on that. And then then you have the MG studies that are going to support that too, because you're going to show someone like, oh, look, or the hack squat, which everyone loves to use that one. Like, oh, it's lighting the quads up like crazy. And oh, this person doing barbell back squat, it kind of isn't. There's like glute, there's quad a little bit, there's even bat, low back stuff going on. Like, oh, it's not as focused. So if you want to develop your yep. legs, the barbell back squat isn't the best thing. It's like, well, there's you're not telling the whole story. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I got tagged on that again that and that's kind of making its waves uh through through this the space of this idea that it's machines so are misleading. better for hypertrophy than than free weights are and no I, you I know call what the bullshit. best is the best is both both yeah, yeah. it's such a simple answer yeah. it is all right check this out there's a company we've been working with for a very long time called organifi they have high quality ingredients uh they're very convenient great tasting they have superfood blends that make it easy and enjoyable to add more variety and nutrition to your day. They have green juices, gold juices, red juices, all organic. They have plant-based protein powders and much more. Great company, all organic, all third-party tested. Go check them out. Head over to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash mind pump. And then use the code mind pump and get a huge 20% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Ali McLeod. What are some tips for getting better at barbell squats when you have long legs slash femurs? Well, the, the leverage. Uh, the guy with the longest legs in here uh, is Adam. He's busy. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. actually was a that was a huge challenge for me. But um, why it was a challenge has less to do with the long femurs and more to do, I think, with um, poor ankle mobility. Right. So that. And I use the I use that kind of as a, an excuse why I didn't squat below ninety for the longest time. I was like, oh, I'm a real tall, long guy, therefore I have to have this major major forward lean when I squat. So I had a low bar set up. I would let my chest fall forward a lot more, and I would only hit about ninety degrees. And it was because I had long femurs, mm -hmm. you know. When in reality, what it really was was that I had poor ankle mobility, and working on the ankle mobility allowed. Uh, my my knees to travel further over my toes, which then allowed me to get deeper into hundred percent. When into my you have squat. long legs, that's the thing is that you 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 need to have more travel with your ankles. Short someone who's short typically isn't going to have as much. Right, and that and yeah. by the way, I'm not. Hopefully, I didn't come off that that I'm like knocking this person for saying that they have long. That, that's it is because you have longer femurs. Exactly what you said. You need more room to be able mm -hmm. to travel your knees to travel over. And so if you don't work on that ankle mobility, well, a good tell for that, right, is is if you elevate your heels and you find yourself easier in to get down in in further in depth. Yep. Yeah, and, and you know comfortably. Yeah. Uh, so if that's the case, then you. you definitely would want to look into uh, ankle mobility. And I, and I think that's a, a okay thing to do, right? I, I think there's, and there's a couple camps in this area of like, you know, some people, oh, the, the um, uh, squat, squat shoes, shoes are a crutch or, you know, elevating your heels on one of those platforms is a crutch and you're not, I, I think you can do both. I did both. So while I was working on my ankle mobility and because I wanted to get deeper in my squat, um, I was using squat shoes, yeah. but then I would still do the ankle mobility work. And then over time, I got more and more comfortable in that deep squat position. Now I'm at a place where I can actually sit ass to grass, barefoot, um, and loaded with like my max weight that I that I move. And That's just it. Like you can use these things to allow you to do a full squat, but then continue to work on the barriers as to why you can't squat in your most natural state, which is, you know, with flat shoes. Yeah. Um, because it'll benefit you. It benefits you to have more control over greater ranges of motion, um, of course, within reason, of all of your joints, including the ankle joint. Uh, if you have a greater control and you're able to flex and extend it and have control over these greater ranges of motion, it's going to make you more functional in everyday life. It's going to make you more effective at lots of different exercises and stronger and less prone uh, to injury because I mean, how many times people hurt their ankles because they're running or moving or they move laterally and they're, and because the ankle moves outside of a range of motion they own, they lose stability right away and they roll their ankle or hurt themselves. Right. So, but that's gotta be the main thing. Now you, you can also throw maybe thoracic mm -hmm. stability and strength there, although that's not, um, 
a tall person issue per se. I'd say it's a lot of other, you know, a lot of. A lot well, of and it has issue. less to do with your well, femurs. Than yes. Anybody. So we're talking if you're if we're talking about legs and ankle mobility, but if you're just talking about in general being a tall mm -hmm. person, what well, are some shoulder things? mobility too? For just like like you're saying, if you're trying to load a little bit lower in your back, yes. Like for instance, to kind of counterbalance if you find that forward lean is a problem. You know that may be something to address as well. My my favorite, um, and I kind of made this up. I, I I had never seen anybody do this, but um, I ankle mobility and then your and then priming like my my thoracic region was yeah. huge to getting in this more upright deep squat position. Uh, and after time of working on both of them to where I could finally kind of get in that position, my favorite, prime, how I prime now is so different than what I used to. I used to have to like break up all the joints and then, you know, spend a bunch of time on each one individually, where now I can sit down all the way in the deep squat and then I grab a band. I have a video on my Instagram and so I'll have Andrew sh uh, show that clip or whatever of... Um, th this is how I prime now, where I actually just get down in the squat position. I have a band around yeah. the squat rack, and then mm -hmm. I'm I'm priming the thoracic. So then it helps me get my chest more upright and prime that upper back. Yeah. In addition, I'm also it's hard for you to see because you can't see exactly my feet and what's going on intrinsically, but I'm actually trying to push my knees forward, open up my hips. You know, I'm trying to grip the floor at the same time. And then I'm also doing these rear delt flies kind of in that, in that, in that position. Yeah, but there's a lot of good exercises you could do also, if this is real challenging for you, working on your ability uh, to be able to squat properly. I mean, you could use any split stance exercise is essentially a similar, it's almost like a squat, right? It's a split stand squat. So, Lunges, forward step, back step lunges are really good. Uh, mm -hmm. Bulgarian split stand squats are really good. Step ups are also really good. These are all great exercises that you can do while you're working on your ability to squat better. I love that idea too, and I think um, I think the knees over toes guys uh, shows this right where that, that's a great uh, point. Sal is like not only working on the ankle mobility as far as the priming stuff. Um, but then when you're doing like a lunge, like when you do the lunge, you take your time in that lunge. And every time you lunge forward, you you, you try and drive that knee, yes. forward, mm -hmm. which is kind of counterintuitive because we were taught. For we were so, taught so uh, differently. The opposite. Yeah. I mean, I remember as a trainer, I used to actually stand uh, with my hand oh my God, yeah. me too. lined yeah. up with their toes. And then when they would lunge, shift their weight yeah, back. I would tell my clients, as soon as you feel my hand, you would shift your weight back into your hips mm -hmm. and, oh, you, you don't want your knees to go over your toes. It was so bad, you know, looking back now on that, that advice. And so the the opposite is true. Is I, if I was working on someone's ankle mobility, I would move to a lunge. Well, it's and, not bad, but it was just different uh, application, right? So if you were to then um, you know focus on getting that knee further forward, it, it'll help. You know, it, it's more conducive towards the squat because that's where you want your trajectory to end up. Yeah. Totally. Next question is from Likey Van Fastenhout. Can Yin Yoga be used as mobility training, or is it different? Okay, so let's let's describe Yin Yoga first. So Yin Yoga is a form of yoga where you get into a position, usually a stretch type position or pose, and you hold it for very long periods of time while trying to breathe through it, while trying to relax your body. So it's, it's almost like static stretching. There's a lot of static stretching involved in yin yoga. So it's like you get into you know, pigeon position and you hold that position for like three minutes. Okay. So is that by itself good mobility work? No. As part of a mobility routine, it could be though. Now, why isn't it by itself good mobility? Because static stretching or long stretches increase range of motion, but they don't do anything to give you better connection over that new range of motion. So just because now I can you know, stretch my arm further back, that doesn't mean I have more mobility in the sense that I don't, I don't have strength over that new range of motion. In fact, if I move into that new range of motion, doing an exercise with weight on me, my, in, my risk of injury actually goes up. So now how does this help with mobility as part of a mobility routine? Well, if you're really tight and you work on increasing range of motion, but then you combine it with ways of connecting to that new range of motion, now you've got a good mobility approach. So uh, if I'm to understand, like, cause I've never done a yin yoga class. I hear you talk about it like pretty what? frequently. I I know, mind blowing, right? <laughs> like I look like a total yin yoga guy. Yeah. I wear the shirts and everything. Um, but he likes happy baby. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of it being a little bit more on the passive side versus active in terms of these poses, like how much emphasis is <clears throat> on, you know, kind of creating that in intrinsic tension. It's not. So it's much more um, passive. So like, whereas uh, traditional yoga, I'm in a pose and I'm creating tension. Like if you really do like proper yoga, you're creating tension and support. You're not allowing the mat to support you or just, 
sitting lax with your joints. You want to stay active. Yin yoga, you're getting these positions, um, you know, like, uh, like, like I said, like happy baby or pigeon or, um, you know, different types of position on the ground. And you're trying to settle into the position and stretch. So it's more parasympathetic. Y it's, very, yeah. that's where the yin comes from. Not, yeah. not only that, but, <clears throat> and by the way, I, if I had a client that was doing yin yoga, I would totally be like, keep doing it, especially if you like it. Cause there's, a, there's mental benefits that come with that too. Huge. Yes. Thank right? you. So there's, there's other benefits that come with like something like yin yoga. So, and I think it's an incredible practice. And if I had a client that loves doing it, I would totally promote them doing it. And then if they, but if they were to ask me something like, so Adam, does this count as my mobility exercises that you were wanting me to do? I would say no. And the, the reason why I'd say no is that uh, mobility is ideally supposed to be targeted for what you need. Mm -hmm. Right where you're taking a yin yoga class, you have some teacher up there who doesn't know any of your imbalances or where you lack mobility. They're just going to teach this really cool organized uh, organized flow of movements yeah. that's going to help relax you and calm you down and put you in some nice static stretches, which is all positive. But you may have, like for example, like there's I, I don't I've taken some yoga classes and there wasn't a lot of emphasis on like a, an, a specific like ankle mobility exercise. There were some things that required a little bit more ankle mobility, but it wasn't very direct, right? Where that was an area I needed to be mm -hmm. hyper focused on. So I could have done a thousand happy trees and downward dogs and all these things like that, which are all beneficial, positive things they have for way you. Names, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if if I wasn't doing my combat stretch mm -hmm. in there, I, I was really limiting my progress of working on my deep squat. Hence the last question that we just talked about. And so, you know, mobility ideally is more targeted and the more targeted you could be, the more frequent you can do that. So I would, if I found like, let's say three mobility exercises that I knew really made a huge difference on my client, right? So, so they, they have really rounded shoulders. They have uh, poor ankle mobility and they have like really locked up hips and they have ter terrible external rotation. Well, 90 90s combat stretch and then like the zone one test are like three movements I want them to religiously do. And I would way rather them spend a whole hour in those three movements than spend an hour of 12 random movements. Yes, Does that make yes, sense? Yes. And, and it, it, it also sounds to me like it's completely in contrast with mobility. Uh, being that, that it's more passive, it's more uh, access of range of motion uh, with, you know, more flexibility being the focus in terms of being able to be loose and, uh, you know, calm your system down, address all the stress and the tensing mm. uh, sort of mechanism, whereas mo mobility is more focused on like bringing in that strength support system, that stability around the joint. Uh, and that's why we do add that bit of tension, but it's focused tension around the joint for support. Yes. Um, more range of motion does not necessarily mean you have better mobility. In fact, in some cases, it could mean worse mobility. Um, you know, I, I like I, I've used this example before. Like a baby has tremendous ranges of motion. You take a baby and you can take their feet and you can move them all over the place, but they have really bad stability, which means they're not very mobile. I mean, they move, they can't move very well on their own. And if if you do put them in a position where they're stretched, you put any load on them, uh, they'll hurt themselves. Not that I suggest you put load on a baby, but that's just the, the it's an easy example to understand. First, the kids with cigarettes now loading. <laughs> Smoke oh cigarettes God. and do squats for babies. We're going to piss so many Six-month-old babies, yeah. Next question is from Grant Satterthwaite. Uh, how do you guys approach training and nutrition on vacation when not actively cutting or bulking? I, that's changed for me in my journey. Um, I, think I, was, I think I was way more stressed out about this, and I would either, one, go way off the rails and, and, and put on a bunch of bad weight, or be, you know, f crazy and, you know, bring my food and be counting macros still on vacation where I think I have a much more loose approach. And I, and one of the things, although this, this is more recent that has really promoted that and like this, the Cabo trip we just took made me feel this way is when we brought up that study, um, that we've referred to multiple times now that I thought was really fascinating by the people that took an entire week off of, of training completely, uh, still that saw the same progress as someone that was, you know, training right. consistently every single day. And I thought, you know, having a week of like not weighing, measuring, tracking food, or, you know, potentially maybe hitting my protein, missing my protein and take a little bit here. It's not going to be the end of the world. And so as long as I don't like eat like an asshole, like I say all the time on this trip, I'm actually going to just I'm going to just enjoy myself and and not stress too much because a week of 
off the diet a little bit and not training is not considered. Yeah, it's if you go extreme is where it's really going to hurt you. Yeah, the key is how you go into it. Uh, if you're super restrictive going into a vacation, like I, I got to eat just this many calories, I got to just do this perfect thing, and oh my god, I can't wait till I go on vacation. When you go on vacation, you're going to deal with this opposite direction binge, binge yeah. It, where yeah. you're not even enjoying what you're eating. You're not even enjoying the the the, the process of vacation. It's like yeah. impulse just took over. Yes. So how you go in makes a big difference. And the other thing too is like, what do you like? What do you value? Why are you on vacation? Um, now, this may be not true for for you, someone watching, but for most people, and in my experience, when I go on vacation, I'm there to enjoy the people I'm with, to connect with the people I'm with, to get out of my routine, to relax, which also means I'm not going to pay much attention to my nutrition. Now, that doesn't mean what I said earlier, which is I binge because I was so restrictive, because I go into it with with more of a balanced approach also. So then when I'm on vacation... It's like, you know, oh, I didn't eat breakfast. Not a big deal because we're over here hiking or at the beach. And then, oh, lunch comes. Cool. What are they making? I'll have some of that too. You know, you just, not, I'm not worried about it. Yeah. Like what a wonderful way to ruin your vacation, right? Yeah. It's, to, it's to go in either crazy direction where you go so extreme binge that when you get home, you're like, oh my God, that vacation. I really got to, you know, I got to turn things around. Then you go back and restrict or... You, you know, you're not going places and enjoying yourself because you're like, I need a protein bar because we're going to go on this trip, this, this hike, and yeah. I'm not going to have food in the next hour or, you know, just that's vacation is there, there are health benefits to vacation that have nothing to do with yeah. getting ripped or bulking or building muscle. The health benefits come from other things. Well, I think that's what you really need to assess is like, what do you get out of vacation? What are you trying to get out of vacation? You know, and like uh, having some kind of mindset going in uh, beforehand. So it, like some of those things aren't just like, it's it's to completely like shut off like all of my barriers in terms of like the way that I eat, you know, normally. So now I'm allowed to like, you know, just, go crazy and, and impulsive or, you know, am I trying to relax and I'm going to try to come back refreshed and, you know, apply certain practices that I've learned to, to love doing just because it's part of my like everyday active routine. Like I try and stay active while I'm on vacation just because I enjoy how that makes me feel. Yes. Uh, but now I can like use that as kind of an adventure. So I go see things, but then also I want to decompress. So I also like manage that time. So I'm like, sitting around i'm not doing anything listen building building and losing muscle is a very slow process losing body fat and gaining body fat is actually a pretty slow process where it gets accelerating crazy is the extremes yeah, yeah if you actually spent seven days and all seven days you overate but not crazy over it you just over eight by five to seven hundred calories every day Not which means bounce you know, back yeah every meal you're you're eating a little more than usual you're having a dessert or maybe you're having a couple of alcoholic drink alcohol drinks in the day and stuff like that and you're enjoying your vacation it ain't going to be as bad as you think it is where it is and, and I, I love your point sal of like how you go into it is so important and i think that is the, the most common mistake in fact i have a client right now who's you know asking me for advice right now getting ready to go on a trip and she's like wanting to be hardcore heading into it, right, and get as best shape she can. She's restricting how hard and increased volume yeah. and all this stuff is going up right now, which I'm not against that, but you have to be careful of what that sets you up for potentially, especially if you're going to go the opposite. You're going to go like, all right, now I'm on vacation. No rules apply. And because you are restricting so hard and pushing for yep. so much leading into it, it really promotes that swing in the opposite direction versus you kind of cruise into vacation of your normal lifestyle of making good choices and doing an exercise and training and then vacations here and now yeah. the difference is like okay maybe i will or won't lift weights but i'll probably be active go for walks go for yeah. hikes do things like that and then i'm gonna enjoy a drink i'm gonna eat out i'm gonna do those things but i'm not gonna stuff myself the, the difference for me on vacation is my daily structure is different my daily structure when i'm not on vacation I'm, it's very structured because i have a family i got kids i got work so I work out at 6.30 a.m. and I go to work and then I come home and I eat at this time just because I have all this busy stuff. When I'm on vacation, I don't have those responsibilities. That's the biggest difference is I just don't have the structure. Oh, I could wake up later, work out, maybe, maybe not if I feel like it, eat, yeah, if I feel like it, you know. I used to flexibility be, there. Yeah, I used to be I used to be like I would go and binge like crazy on vacation because it was like, oh, this is it. This is free one all time in. all year to do this, right? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Next question is from Micah2448. What are some of the best uses of your time when taking long breaks between sets? <laughs> Rest, nothing. This is Stare funny. The wall. I know. When I used to, I used to have clients that were like, what, what do I what do I do while I'm yeah. sitting here? I mean, I don't know. 
uh, write a book, Think about, read. Yeah, I don't care. Do whatever you want. Just well, don't the, do any exercise. There's two versions of this for me personally, um, and how I would probably advise a client. And that is like my goals are very important to how I would answer this. So if I'm on a, if I'm on like this kick where I'm trying to make moves and my, and I'm really trying to get after my workouts, I'm trying to be consistent. Like I want to be super into my, my mm. routine. So my phone is not with me. It's uh, I'm listening to music, but it's not in my hand between sets. I'm not scrolling on Instagram. I'm not working. I'm not doing anything. I'm like sitting there. I'm, I'm letting my heart rate come down. I'm already visualizing the next set. Like I am into my workout. Like if I'm trying to maximize results yeah. and I'm on a serious case now I'm not that way right now, right now I'm, you know, maintaining health and stay in balance. And so between sets, I work. And I would never recommend that to somebody. I get on my, I answer an email. I do things that I would totally tell a client who is trying to make progress in their in their training journey. Like that's not a good strategy for you. But hey, if you're at a place in your life where you know this is part, you never miss workouts. You're consistent. You're not trying to really make any progress right now. You're just trying to stay healthy and balanced and strong. Then well, yeah, you know what they're looking what for. Want. They're looking for more exercise. Oh, you think fitness. that's what it is? Yes. Oh God, yeah. The no. old like I rest. Do rubber band a uh, rest? Yes. In between, it's like that's not rest. Yes. Like, what's the I most effective? Like, how do I make my workout more effective? I got these minute windows in between exercises. So the best use in the, so that would go to my my first version of me, right? Yes. If you are trying to make the most gains in your workout then it's not doing something necessarily physically. It's actually visualizing yes. and like being very focused, not letting any of the outside distractions get in, get in your head. And you are, if that's music for you or silence, whatever, but you are already, you're visualizing the next set yes. and you're thinking about your workout and how it felt and your, and how your muscles feel right now. Like, and bringing your heart rate down by breathing in through your nose. That's, that's a big one. Yeah. Right? In terms of like, so anything when I'm coaching athletes is like, how quickly can we get that heart rate down? That's right. How masterful, are you at getting to that calm state because that's the the top tier athletes just have that ability so even within the most like extreme uh environments where they have to perform at like a really high level like they could be doing these crazy intensive bouts but then find themselves to that calm state and then be able to perform again because i mean that's if you're really trying to squeeze out on the performance end of it like if you think in those terms about focus heart rate lowering breathing, you know, that's where I would stay. You're yeah. right. They, you know, they, they've done like studies on some of your high performing athletes. And that's one of the most things, one of the things they have most in common in these crazy high pressure situations or they're getting ready to do like a double backflip with a dirt bike or something. And their heart rate is like, 50 beats per yep. minute. Calmest just, athletes are at the just top. Just calm as so where something like one of us would be like racing like crazy, panting because you got, yep. if you have that ability to do that in your workouts, you're going to get the most at every one of your yep. sets. And so, rest in between sets is extremely important when it comes to building muscle and strength. Uh, not resting between sets means you're basically turning it into an endurance cardio workout, and which which is fine if that's what you're looking for. But when it comes to the muscle building effects of, of strength training, the rest in between is very important. I that's would say that's one of the worst it. things you could do in between sets is a bunch of activity in there. I mean, that's worse than being distracted. You're I think, ruining on the, the workout. Yeah. yeah. You're, You're totally muddying ruining the workout. waters. Absolutely. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injuries.